Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the um, Human Rights Initiative Lecture Series. My name is Kiyoteru Tsutsui. I'm an assistant professor in sociology and uh, program director of the Human Rights Initiative at the International Institute here. Um, Human Rights Initiative is a forum for discussion um, about human rights related issues in the contemporary world, and we invite several um, renowned scholars and practitioners per year um, to promote our intellectual debates around human rights and deep understanding of human rights issues that we face today. And this year we have a, a great lineup. Uh, and to kick things off, uh, we have Pro Professor Emily Hafner Burton, whom I will introduce in a moment. And um, on October 22nd, we have Ryan Goodman from NYU Law School giving a talk. The title is Socializing States, How to Promote Human Rights Through International Law. Uh, that talk will happen in the same room at 4 p.m. And on November 4th, uh, we have Elsa, Elsa Stamatopoulou, who was instrumental in establishing indigenous rights as a, a big component of the UN human rights system. She worked at the UN for a while, and now she's at the She's at Columbia University, and she's going to give a talk entitled The Indigenous Emergency. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of speakers uh, we're working on in the winter, but that, that's uh, it's a little premature to talk about them. Um, but please take note of those two talks, again, October 22nd at 4 p.m. and November 4th at uh, 4 p.m. Um, right? And today it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Professor Emily Hafner Burden, um, old friend of mine going back to graduate school. And um, she has been one of the most productive and influential scholars in international relations in general, and uh, more specifically on um, international human rights, research around international human rights. She has, if you look at her CV, she has an amazing record of publications, um, four or five uh, peer-reviewed articles per year, and uh, two books, uh, four years in between, or something like that. Um, she has a PhD in political science from University of Wisconsin, and uh, she has done postdoc and, and done teaching at um, Oxford University, Stanford University, Princeton University, and now she is professor of um, at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies and director of the Laboratory on International Law and Regulation at the University of California, San Diego. And her research has been on uh, broadly around um, how international efforts okay, to address issues of with global relevance and concern, um, how those efforts may or may not uh, help in solving the kinds of social problems we face in the world, uh, including human rights violations, trade disputes, uh, gender inequality, uh, warfare, terrorism, election violence, and so on. And um, her, her research is especially unique in, um, or oh, maybe not unique, but it, it's especially strong in her use of systematic data uh, looking at a large number of countries in the world uh, using quantified data and complementing that with qualitative uh, accounts. And um, she examines how states come to cooperate with each other to solve problems, global issues, and uh, what kind of institutional designs might motivate them to join in international agreements, and what incentives under what conditions would um, make states deliver on the promises they make when they ratify human rights treaties or when they agree to uh, uh, trade agreements. Okay. And um, she has won uh, many awards and received many grants and too many to list, uh, but her excellence is um, evidence, especially in her winning of the Karl Deutsch Award, which is presented annually to a scholar um, under the age of 40 who is judged to have made the most significant contribution to the study of international relations and peace research. She just won that award uh, last year. Okay. And uh, again, she has many article publications. And, and her first book, Forced to be Good, 
uh, came out of Cornell University Press in 2009, which looks at how trade agreements may or may not uh, help improve human rights practices. And uh, today she's here to talk about her new book, Making Human Rights a Reality, which just came out this year uh, from Princeton University Press. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Emily Hafner Burton. Thank you, Keo. Um, that was too kind, as always. Uh, Professor Tutsi, as he mentioned, is a really old friend of mine from graduate school. Whoop, in the dark. And um, there's not going to be too many slides, so if you prefer to be in the light, uh, let me know. It's up to you. Uh, and a lot of the work that he and I have done together has been extremely influential in my career and in shaping my thinking in general, and plays a very large role in this book and uh, in some of the themes that I want to talk with you today. So thank you and to the Institute for the invitation to be here, and thank you for joining me for this discussion. So what I'd like to talk with you about today is the promotion of international human rights norms, and specifically I want to talk about the politics of actually trying to implement human rights norms. And I promised uh, Professor Tutsi, who I'm used to calling Keo, so apologize if I keep <laughs> calling you by your first name, uh, that I would not give my standard academic talk. I was not going to present a paper and give you tons of statistics, uh, which is what I generally do, and then a punchline. But instead, what I wanted to do was to really reflect on what I have learned in the past 15 years of doing this type of social science research in the area of human rights, and as I've reflected that in this book, which was really written for a much more general audience, uh, no statistics, uh, lots of data and information, but it's all in the footnotes, so I would give you a much less academic and much more sort of let's have a discussion about a really important set of policies and what I think I've learned about them and what implications there might really be for the real world, for the political situation and for, for policy. So that's what I would like to do today. And I want to start with by making a really, really simple point, but we're going to come back to it because it's really important, which is what are human rights, right? They're, they are moral assurances. They are for all of us in this room. They are for all of us in this world, and that is regardless of our sex, our nationality, our religious bringing, upbringing uh, and faith, our linguistic orientation, et cetera, et cetera, right? They are universal and they are indivisible, and that means that we are not supposed to pick and choose among these different rights. Over the past 60 years, what we've done is to create a very elaborate system of international laws and norms and doctrines and procedures and institutions based on these principles, to create these principles, to codify and develop these principles. And so membership is growing in a very wide array of different types of institutions that are designed to promote precisely these principles. And this is incredibly powerful. Right? This legal approach articulates a vision of the world that has fundamentally changed the way we think about human rights, the way we think about what is acceptable, uh, and the way we engage with foreign policy. But there is a fundamental problem, and it's one of the problems that I've been working on for a while, which is that you, like me, are probably watching the news. Okay? And you just saw what happened in Egypt uh, several weeks ago where we had an unprecedented use of lethal force by the government to disperse protesters, right, leading to one of the worst modern mass atrocities in Egyptian history. I won't even mention what's going on in Syria because you're watching the news like me. Over 100,000 people dead. There are no uh, sides that aren't guilty in the atrocities that are occurring. Okay. So you might be surprised when you hear that both of these countries, Syria and Egypt, have legally bound themselves to protect human rights through a variety of different international legal mechanisms. They've ratified treaties protecting civil rights and political rights and economic and social and cultural rights and outlawing discrimination against women and protecting children's rights and outlawing torture and so on and so forth. Okay? So they're pretty highly embedded in the legal system. They've ratified these treaties, and yet, of course, mass atrocities are occurring that are violating these principles left and right. And this has nothing to do specifically with Egypt and Syria because they're not alone. Many, many, many countries in the world in which we live today bind themselves, swear to pursue and promote human rights, and they do it by legally binding themselves to a system, and then they simply break those obligations when it becomes inconvenient for them to do so. Let's see here, where am I? So I promised I wouldn't show lots of data. I promise I won't uh, do too much more than this. But I think it's helpful to look at this picture to just give you a sense of what I mean. These data aren't perfect, 
but we have organizations that have been collecting records that give us information about different types of human rights abuses, and this shows you political prisoners, disappearances, killings, torture, okay, around the world all the way back since the 1970s. And these little dotted lines here simply show you the number of countries in any given year that have ratified really one of the strongest and best uh, treaties that we have on human rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a central part of the International Bill of Human Rights. And what the striped boxes show you are the number of countries every year that these very credible sources have told us these are the states that, despite participating in this regime and ratifying this treaty, along with others, are still nonetheless guilty of violating these rights, right? So that picture, to me, is very disturbing. And it's what I want to grapple with today, with you, which is given the fact that the reality is we live in a world full of a lot of laws and a lot of advocates and a lot of norms and a lot of, on paper, commitment to these legal principles. We see, nonetheless, so much in the way of violations. What can we do? What can we do, if anything, to try harder to close this gap between the promises that states and leaders are making on paper and between the actual behavior that they then uh, articulate and, and operate under? What can we do? I'm a political scientist, uh, but I really firmly have come to the belief that there's not a single discipline that can answer this question. This is an interdisciplinary problem, and we need to be thinking about it uh, in that way. We need to be talking with practitioners. We need to be looking to criminology and sociology and economics and law and anthropology and psychology, uh, etc., to really try and get a handle on what's happening uh, here. So that's really what my goal uh, has been in writing this book, is to do a very broad survey to see if we can learn something from other fields and disciplines that might help us say something about how do we close this gap? Can we do anything to get closer? I have a, a lot of arguments, but I, I don't want to complicate it too much. I want to really make sort of three central points to you today, and I want to tell you what they are briefly and then we'll walk, them through, walk you through in, in more detail before we get into our discussion. The first is that all of the statistical evidence that we have been uh, accumulating in the last decade or so as we've really developed the data and these techniques suggests that the international human rights legal system corresponds best with actual protections for human rights and improvements for protection in human rights in very special circumstances, okay? I mean, there are conditions generally in the settings where the worst types of human rights abuses are not taking place and are not likely to take place uh, to begin with, right? Despite that evidence, and we'll talk a little bit about that momentarily, policy efforts, by and large, have focused on creating more of these institutions, bigger laws and webs of nets and legal procedures and doctrines. So we're growing the system despite the fact that we have some evidence that the system itself is quite limited in its capacity for broad sweeping influence, okay? And I think we need to ask ourselves whether this is a good policy or whether we need to think, rethink that strategy. The second point I'd like to make today is that I think we need to focus in our discussions more than we have been up until now on the actors that have the most influence in this process. NGOs are unbelievably important, but they are not the most powerful actors when it comes to making human rights decisions. That is states. They are at the center of the problem, and they are at the center of many of the solutions. And we need to start talking in more detail than we have been in the scholarly community about what states can do to really improve these practices, and if anything, to narrow that gap between law and practice. These are the government engines of human rights, and I do believe they can do more. But the third point I want to make is that we need to talk about what that strategy would look like, because I think it probably needs to look pretty different than the status quo. Right? I'm going to make a couple of different arguments about what that might look like, but one is that states need to change strategy in their efforts to promote human rights to localize their foreign policy. In other words, to try and actually translate what they're doing into a local context that doesn't make it seem like the West is imposing its interests on the West, because that is causing huge problems for the effectiveness of foreign policy and the ability to promote human rights, and oftentimes what we see is a backfire, and that's not helpful. 
The other thing I wanted to talk with uh, you about is a change in how we deal with the fact that resources to promote human rights on all levels are scarce. We don't have enough of them to utilize them in all situations all of the time, and that forces us into a very uncomfortable position of having to figure out how to make choices about where to utilize the resources. And I want to talk about one possible way to think about doing that, which looks different, I think, than the current approach. So I'm going to uh, date myself now. Um, and I could no longer win that award because I did turn 40 this year, uh, so there you go. Um, but I used to work in the United Nations. I had the honor of working there way back in the day when Kofi Annan was uh, the Secretary General. He was really uh, quite an amazing man. And he said once that we would not enjoy security without development, we would not have development without security, and that we would have neither of these things without the protection for human rights. And he's absolutely right. So the issue is how do we address that aspiration in a pragmatic way that deals with the facts on the ground or what we think we know about the facts on the ground, and I'm happy to talk to you about where we think we know and where we don't, about what really works in the promotion process. So that's what I'd like to talk with you about today. So for me, really, the ultimate goal in writing this book was to try and understand how international law and power through the vehicle of the state can work better in tandem to protect human rights. Answering that question requires first that we briefly have a discussion about what we think is causing the problem in the first place. So I teach at a policy school. One of the first things I always tell my students, if you want to do policy evaluation, you had better have a causal model of the behavior that you're trying to change. Don't start with the advocacy institutions. Start with the incentive structures of the, of the actors and their preferences and try and figure out what's motivating them to do what they do. And then we can start talking about how you design policies to change that incentive structure. So I want to start there um, very briefly. My causal model, uh, and there are lots of different things going on, so I'm going to make some real simple gener generalizations right now, is that I think it's very useful to think about human rights abuses in very instrumental terms, by which I mean that these are not the acts by and large, of sort of insane madmen and madwomen who can't control themselves and who are doing criminally insane things. There are exceptions. Uh, we can certainly debate that. But most, I think, are people responding to incentives and opportunities in their environment for abuse. And that means that these actions that you're looking at up here oftentimes are calculated done purposefully, deliberatively, sometimes, oftentimes, they are planned and they involve the mobilization of entire apparatus of organizations, okay? These acts reflect the seemingly rational, from the eyes of the perpetrator, right, behaviors. Now, I want to say something further about this, which is important, I think, which is that once underway, though, rationalizations become very important in this process. And group incentives can reinforce all of these nasty actions that we see. This model of abuse that I'm laying out for you here suggests that the tasks for the legal instruments and the policy instruments that we might talk about together today is to make perpetrators of these abuses change the calculus, to make them believe that the costs and the risks of engaging in the behavior have changed. That's the way you're going to get a change in their behavior. Preaching, not going to have any effect. So before I turn to how law and policy play a role in this, let me just say a few brief words about the contexts that the literature knows leads to abuse, and then a little bit more about the psychology. And it's unfortunate that um, Christian Davenport isn't here. For those of you who don't know him, please go meet him. Uh, he's in political science. He has done a lot of the research on the context that I'm about to talk about, which has been very influential. And essentially, we know that the context matters tremendously, OK? So situations like war, the situation like conflict all-out war in Syria right now, right? These create clear incentives on all sides of a conflict to engage in perpetrative abusive behavior such as the type that we're looking at here. It's easier to legitimize and justify abuses in these types of contexts. It is easier to put policies into place under states of emergency to curb freedoms of speech, et cetera, right, in the name of 
the security of the nation. And we know that conflict teaches and breeds cycles of violence in countries, much like it does in the home and in the family structure. We have a lot of evidence to suggest as much. It erodes social ties. It creates crisis, uh, cultures of crisis uh, environments, all of which create incentives. Another big contextual motivator, illiberal rulers like Assad. Right? He's not accountable to the public. The government institutions, the courts, the legislatures, they are not independent from his rule. Right? They cannot operate independently. Poverty, inequality, many, many, many different types of contexts that we can talk about if you'd like to do. But I want to return to the psychological component for one more moment before we get into talk about the policies, because this is really important to thinking about the causal model of how you can change behavior. Okay. Decades of psychological experiments, many of which are now illegal, by the way, uh, to actually uh, undertake, have taught us that perpetrators of abuse are doing what they are doing because they believe, whether it's correct or not their belief, that they have something to gain from this process. Might be power, might be job, might be money, might be a sense of superiority, might be uh, searching for respect, right? You, you name it. And so again, they're making choices that in their mind oftentimes appear not only rational and practical, but lawful, sometimes even morally justifiable. And we can find lots and lots of evidence when you go and you start interviewing these people and you look at the records of how they justify what they've done, right? C clear crimes against humanity. So I'll give you a couple of, of examples before we move on. Klaus Barbie was on trial in 1987. He tortured Jews and members of the French resistance during World War II. He sent many people uh, to death at the camps. And in his defense, he said, I was simply doing my job. War is war. Hugo Garcia, he was a torturer for the military junta in the 1970s in Uruguay. And he explained in an interview, very telling quote, I'm a victim too. My superiors who got me into this, they made me do it. They told me things that were not true. I never took the initiative to start torturing someone. I was given the orders. And there's a long list uh, of such things where you can really deeply see the psychological rationales that take place here. So the social and political institutions in which the people who are uh, operating uh, under these types of incentives can easily get reinforced by the social and political situations in which we're embedded because almost all of these types of acts that we are attempting to stop don't usually involve one person for one situation, one time, uh, with one motivation. They almost always require collective action. They almost always have those higher up on a chain who have given perhaps orders and those at the lower levels who carry those things out and it's never always clear where the responsibility lays and institutions surround that and that makes it very hard to stop behavior that's based on collective action unless you can really get to the node, which isn't easy. So again, I want to reiterate why I'm making this, this point because there's a major policy implication here for now how we need to start thinking about the impact of different policies and what they can do. And that's that uh, approaches that are based on telling perpetrators alone that what they're doing is wrong or illegal or immoral, not likely to be effective, right? Unless those uh, calls can seem convincing because the laws are seen as legitimate and because they are backed up with consequences for breaking the law. And without those things, we're not likely to see the change in behavior. So if you go and talk to criminologists, they're going to tell you people obey law for three reasons. This is really important for us. One is just pure coincidence, which is to say that none of us in this room are abusing human rights, not because a bunch of laws tell us not to do it, but because none of us have an interest in doing so. so coincidence. That's not what we're interested in talking about here. The other two reasons are coercion, right? You don't break the law because you know if you do it, you're likely to get caught and punished and you want to avoid the punishment, okay? So this is about changing your calculation of your own risk, okay? Criminologists will tell you that's what the whole criminal justice system in some sense is designed to do, but only a very, very small part of law abiding comes from the coercive process because it's way too expensive to motivate the state apparatus to be coercive in all cases. Most of what law following is about comes from the third, which they might call persuasion, socialization, acculturation. There are different terms for this thing, but this is basically where you're now monitoring yourself. You're 
following the law because you believe it's the right thing to do. It doesn't matter. You're not worried about the consequences of getting caught, right? You're doing it because it's you think that's the correct thing to do, and the legal norm is legitimate in your eyes. So how do we get uh, this stuff, right? If we have these two things, the coercive approach and the per persuasive approach, and this is what's going to change behavior, how do we actualize that into actual policy tools, okay? And one of the main ways that we've been working to do that for 50, 60 more years now has been through the creation of the system of international legal institutions to promote and protect human rights. So I want to take some time now to uh, talk a little bit about that system and what we are learning about it. I'm convinced that there's not a single person in this room who doesn't know something about that system already. So I'm not going to give you any great details about it, but I'm happy to talk about it more if you'd like to when we get into Q&A. I'm simply going to say that the system was obviously designed to do both of these things. So there are elements that are designed to be coercive. In other words, shaming, prosecution, right? That's all about bringing people to justice and deterring others by changing their calculations of risk. And also to be persuasive, right? By convincing you that there are legitimate concepts and obligations out there that you need to believe in uh, and promote uh, as values within yourself and within your society. And this has been tremendously, tremendously successful in getting participation because there is not a single region in this world, not a single culture that doesn't in some way subscribe and participate in this system. Iran, North Korea, Syria, Egypt, they're all, they're all members uh, of, no, not everyone belongs to every component, but they participate. Right? And many states participate in even more deep ways. So I was always interested to see who's sitting on the Human Rights Council, which is one of the main bodies inside the United Nations uh, responsible for the promotion and protection of human rights around the globe. And it's always quite interesting. So current members sitting on that body, Angola, Kazakhstan, Indonesia, Sierra Leone, Uganda. Mm -hmm. It's hard not to laugh when you hear that. I mean, that's oftentimes my reaction. We, I think we could debate and talk about, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do you want that participation or not? The point is, is that participation is widespread and you, you, you have this going on. So the system is big. Uh, it's very dense. It exists at the UN level. There's a European version. There's an American version. There's an African version, a little more complicated. We could talk about that. Um, but of course, the idea is it's going to do precisely these two things at the same time, the coercive element, that's what all these prosecutions are for, uh, and the persuasive element. So I, I want to talk a little bit now about the research that we've developed in the past 10, now 15 years and what that's telling us about how the system actually works. And there's a lot of messages here, and I want to just make two very simple points. The first is that it's allowed us to see with great clarity that decision-making inside this system exhibits a variety of biases that reflect the values uh, and the positions of the key decision makers in the institution, along with the political orientation of the states that appoint those people. So I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean. We know, for example, that the UN has a clear systematic track record of favoritism. If you have put, your country has put peacekeeping troops into a UN mission, we are vastly less likely to shame you through the UN for your human rights violations than if you have the exact same or worse violations, right, uh, but didn't. So quid pro quo, maybe. We don't know what the explanation is, but we can tell you there's a clear systematic empirical pattern there uh, that shows a bias. That is also the case, by the way, for powerful countries, which tend to be systematically undershamed for, I think, uh, in this system. The findings of favoritism, by the way, are not just about the United Nations. We can find different evidence of it in all of the different parts of the system. And I'll give you one example from the European uh, Court of Human Rights, which is really oftentimes considered the crown jewel or the pinnacle, the most important court. Um, it's certainly one of the most important institutions in this system. Judicial appointments here are shaped by political considerations that we can show have had an influence on the way the court actually operates. So specifically, what do I mean? Judges on this court, their, system, their uh, judicial philosophy is systematically linked to the political ideology of the state that appointed them. So they are much more likely to be activist judges if they have been appointed by a left-leaning oriented political uh, state than a right-leaning oriented political state. Judges are more likely to rule in favor of their own country 
than against other countries. Judges close to retirement tend to favor their country more often than do others. So do judges with diplomatic backgrounds, and on and on and on and on. So we can talk about uh, the consequences of these biases, but we can clearly document in a whole variety of ways that there are some systematic biases, and it just simply means the system isn't neutral. It's a good thing uh, that we can learn, uh, learn something about that. I want to talk now about legal effectiveness because it's the thing I'm the most interested in and I think it's very important. I want to focus just for our sake of time on what we've been learning about civil and political rights, but we could happily have a conversation about economic, social, cultural rights as well. Statistical research here is very, very clear, and you won't be surprised to learn that democratic countries that participate in this system are generally pretty good at following through with the commitments that they're making. There are absolutely some exceptions, uh, but we ought not to be surprised because many of these countries are, in fact, the world's leading human rights promoters driving the creation of much of the system. Scholars, by the way, don't agree on why this is the case. Some think it's pure coincidence, and others think the law really has a pull, so we could argue about that, uh, but the data are clear about the direction. They also show that there is a tendency for these laws to correspond pretty well with improvements in human rights in certain countries that have gone through a recent democratization process, countries like Chile, for example. We can show that those countries are much more likely, if they participate in these legal regimes, to do things like promote education for girls uh, and religious freedom and other basic civil liberties. So that's, that's all good, and we can talk about how that works or how we think that works uh, in the Q&A, if you'd like. The more concerning part for me is that the statistics are also very clear and very repetitive in showing that these laws really do not relate well to protections for human rights in the vast majority of the world, and certainly not in the places where vulnerable populations are most likely to be harmed. And this is deeply concerning um, for us. And, uh, Again, almost every single country in the world has participated in this system in some way or another, and so we need to be asking ourselves why are they participating in this system uh, and what ability does the system have to coerce or persuade in those locations when governments are not participating because they sincerely are committed to the establishment and implementation of a norm. So I want to show you simply one more data figure, which I hope you can see. This one just shows you a very simple set of patterns, the exact same uh, set of rights we were just looking at in the exact same treaty. And what it shows you is just change over time. So if you're a country and you ratified this treaty and we've observed your human rights behavior over 35 years, do you ever get better? Can we find any evidence that you ever change your behavior? And this dotted line says no. This is the dotted line that says there's never been a change in behavior. Not one, five, 13, 23, 28 years after participating in this treaty. So we're having a very hard time finding evidence in a lot of places that we're seeing behavioral change. Now, there's something much, much worse uh, and much more puzzling. And Professor Tutsi and I have been struggling with this one for over a decade now which is that there is a fair amount of evidence, and it wasn't just us, it's now been replicated by many other studies after us, that participation in some of these treaties actually corresponds with the probability that you're gonna get worse. Not just that you don't get better, but that you get worse, okay? That's true, for example, with the Convention Against Torture. You're going to be looking here at uh, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but that's true. If you are a country who ratifies the Convention on Torture, you are more likely to torture after you have ratified that treaty than if you are an equal country but you did not ratify. And the thing is so frustrating is we don't know why. We don't know why this is the case. Maybe these treaties are allowing leaders to do worse things after they ratify because they provide some cover. Maybe it's just that these governments are kind of already going downhill and they ratify for whatever reason right at the time that they're going downhill. Maybe these treaties mobilize domestic advocates who then go protest the government for rights and they get squashed by the government. There are all kinds of explanations. We don't know why. So that's a frustration. But whatever the explanation, the data are really beginning to paint a worrisome picture about the correlation between the massive growth of this very impressive system in many ways and actual behavioral changes on the ground. 
So I think we might be wondering, you might be wondering uh, at this point, well, maybe courts are different, right? We're talking about sort of weekly enforced treaties, and I can tell you a little bit about how that process works. Courts, might courts be uh, any different? And the answer is yes, uh, courts are different in a variety of different ways, um, but they're not dramatically different. And I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the little bit here on courts, and we can come back to talking about that uh, in a moment if you'd like to, do, uh, like to do so. But I think we could have a useful discussion about what role for the ICC and what role for some of these regional courts if you'd like to do that. So the question becomes, what can we reasonably conclude then about uh, this system? And what the, the research shows us is clearly that the establishment of domestic stable political institutions, they need not be democratic, by the way, um, but they need be stable. Uh, that's absolutely uh, clear. And economic development matter much, much more for the underlying protection of human rights than does the legal system. That doesn't mean the legal system isn't important. It is extremely important. But while we have some pretty high aspirations for what this system is supposed to do, right, it's very clear that its influence is at best highly uneven around the world, that it is not deeply embedded in the environments where it's probably most needed, that its coercive capacity and deterrent capacity, therefore, is low, generally, and that the non-compliance record is very, very high. And that undermines the legitimacy of the political institutions that are promotional, right? And that is a fundamental problem for how we change behavior. It's very hard to be persuaded about the legitimacy of institutions that put dictators into positions of authority. So we really need to ask ourselves, we've got this institution in place. What can we do to make this institution more effective? Okay. So let's start with the question of reform. And there are two different paths that are uh, already in motion. And one of those is to undertake a whole variety of procedural reforms. I know that's a boring topic, so I won't bore you with the details. Uh, but lots of procedural reforms have long been in place and are still in place to try and improve this system in the margins. And the other is to try and grow the system, to just add on more layers of it and grow the web and make it more effective by making it bigger. So uh, I'm advocate for reform. There's no question about that. But the central message I want to convey to you about this is that I'm quite pessimistic that the reforms that are realistically achievable are going to make a fundamental difference uh, for this regime, because they ultimately are not going to be able to change the things that matter, which are the context and the underlying psychological processes we began this conversation with. They're going to tinker at the margins. That's important, and we should tinker at the margins, but I'm quite pessimistic that that's going to be the save all for the system. And I'll give you sort of three quick reasons, and then I want to shift to talking about foreign policy. First is that reform requires a lot of money and a lot of resources, and I don't think there's a single informed observer that believes that a big infusion of resources is going to get put into that system. Human rights is not a budgetary priority for the United Nations. It never has been. It is very unlikely to become so. The organization, uh, the inter-American system, is basically starved out. Uh, the European system has over 100,000 cases backlog on its docket. Uh, it's probably the best funded system and still uh, uh, can't quite get there. So that's the first reason, is we don't have the resources to really undertake the reforms that are probably needed here. That's not really the big problem, though. That's a big problem, but it's not the only big problem. Even the advocates working inside the system, and this one is a quite interesting one to learn, do not agree on reform. So what you end up having are human rights advocates who ought to be on the same page, bickering with each other over the details of what these reforms should look like. There's no unified coalition. Canada and Australia and the United States can't agree. And so this makes it very difficult to push a unified reform agenda because there is no such thing as a unified reform agenda, even among the committed human rights advocates working inside these systems. That is a real complex problem to solve. The big problem, of course, is that we have to be realistic about why many countries are joining this system. And it's not because they intend to, human, intend to promote or protect human rights. They have no desire to make this system more effective. You have many countries utilizing this system that have absolutely no desire whatsoever of capitulating to any sort of coercive human rights mechanism that might come through this system. And they have veto power, by the way, because they have to ratify agreements, uh, and many of them sit uh, on the process. Right? At the 
end of the line here is state sovereignty. We're not going to get states to do things they don't want to do, and it doesn't matter how we design institutions. Uh, at the end of the day, states will pull out when it becomes inconvenient for them to do so. Okay, so we can talk more about reform uh, and how we can make this system stronger. I think that's important. Um, but I want to turn now to talk about foreign policy for a couple of minutes. Because here, I, I wonder if we can't do more. If we haven't already achieved all the great successes of the legal system, and it's basically done what it's supposed to do. It's done its successful job, and now it's at the water's edge, and we need to be looking at the other actors who can do more, and those are states. So there are already a lot of states running around out there in their own self-interest, for whatever reason, for better or worse, attempting to promote human rights, oftentimes screwing it up, uh, but they're out there and they're doing it. And the power of these states has enormous potential to change this calculus that we're talking about, right? Because states have all these tools that the legal system and many non-governmental organizations don't have. They've got aid and trade. They can help manipulate foreign direct investment. They've got military intervention. They have diplomacy. They have all manner of carrots and sticks and, and tools and methods that are really not available to the other parts of the system. And they, they're already out there using these things, and they think it's in their interests. Okay. Now, of course, the problem is that state power is very, very dangerous, uh, and it creates many concerns because states are not always acting in the best interest of the victims that they are uh, helping to promote. Uh, and they're oftentimes using policies that don't work, and worse, that backfire precisely in the promotion of human rights in the name of promoting human rights. Right? This is a big problem, and this seems like a problem that we should be talking about more and trying to figure out what can we do to change this situation. So I think one of the fundamental reasons that's become clear that when human rights norms are not getting traction, part of the problem is oftentimes that the norms themselves basically don't fit with the local context, right? They seem out of place. They're not seen as legitimate. They're not seen as universal. And they're seen as peddled by institutions, whether that be a foreign government or an international organization, that do not have legitimacy in the eyes of local stakeholders. And it is very hard to promote a foreign policy, to promote human rights, when the very people you're trying to help believe that's an imposition uh, on them and are not actually on, on board with the task. This is a big problem for, for foreign policy, and the remedy here is not that we get states to stop meddling in human rights, because they're going to do it irregardless. Regardless. So the remedy here, and that would be devastating for human rights, by the way, if we had less state power. We need more, not less. So the question is, what can we do? And so I have a couple of suggestions that I want to, to throw out for us to talk about, um, and maybe you'll have others. So I wonder if it is possible, given that part of the problem in the translation of these norms is that people on the ground locally don't know about the norms or reject the concept of many of these norms, is there a way to localize foreign policy by which we better vet and translate our promotion efforts locally on the ground? That's not really the way the US government operates its foreign policy uh, in the current policy space, but it's entirely possible that we would have a much better chance of promoting human rights if we did a much better job of vetting that process and those policies and those norms locally in the political spaces in which we're trying to engage. And we can do that through non-governmental organizations, through national human human rights institutions, through religious leaders, through the relevant local stakeholders on the ground in the area to which we're trying to affect. And stakeholders can help in a variety of ways, right? They can help legitimize a policy right, in ways that legal institutions themselves or state governments themselves oftentimes are not doing very well, right? They can explain these things favorably in a local context. They can act as a bellwether on the appropriateness of these approaches and can help find uh, allies on the ground, right? It is impossible to internalize legal norms unless you have local human rights advocates on the ground uh, who pick up and are stakeholders in this process. And that is a lot of the problem uh, of why we see the gap. They can also, by the way, play a very important role in the implementation process of some of these policies. We could talk more about that. Now, there's a a big caveat to what I've just suggested to you, which is, OK, I'm talking about maybe a different way of thinking about how we utilize and operate our foreign policy that suggests we pay more attention to what people on the ground actually think. Uh, 
But that too can be quite dangerous because having foreign institutions and governments seem like they're in collusion with local actors and stakeholders on the ground, the risk is that you actually undermine the credibility of that stakeholder in their own community, right? Because it's seen uh, as a uh, collusion between foreign interests and local interests. And we have a lot of evidence from anthropology uh, that this is a real problem. So what do we do? Uh, there's really no perfect way to manage this tension. I want to simply raise the tension uh, for you to note it because it's very important. But I think there are a variety of ways we can think about how we might manage or at least lessen some of the harm in doing that. And as that is, if we're going to take an approach to policy where we start embedding and engaging more locally with domestic human rights stakeholders, which again, I really do not believe the vast majority of our policy does, we need resonance with those groups, right? We need to find groups that share the perspectives from the policy, that care about the right. It's very hard to impose external rights from the outside, right? And then you have local stakeholders on the ground. I grew up in North Africa. The, uh, my family grew up in North Africa, I grew up in France, but uh, that's the origin of my family. And you go and you, know, you, you find this discourse uh, about the veil and women's rights. And I can tell you they live in that really differently on the ground in North Africa than they are uh, you know, in this, the legislatures of France who are passing laws telling women they can't wear veils. It's very, very unclear uh, whose rights are being violated by, by doing this. Um, Localizing can really help processes like that. So you need resonance. You need community buy-in for the reasons I've just discussed, which is that I can't come and fund your organization 100% and then hope that your organization is going to have perfect credibility in your location. Advocacy organizations always need local buy-in, and that means from the communities in which they operate, that's how you get people invested uh, in, in the process and caring that it might uh, work. And you need accountability by these organizations for this to work. Okay, so it's one idea I want to put out there about can we think about a different way to approach the promotion of human rights through foreign policy through a localization process. I want to talk about another now, which I'm going to uh, suggest is probably the most controversial part of this book, but I think it's an interesting discussion. And that is triage, okay, which by which I mean a metaphor. And if there's one idea that I hope you walk away with today, it's that the universality of human rights norms, the indivisibility of these core uh, principles, which are the bedrock of the international legal system as we know it, is not a tenable guide for the implementation of human rights as a political strategy. Okay? Those two things are inherently at odds with one another. The resources that we need to protect human rights, whether that come from advocacy organizations, governments, the legal system, we do not have enough resources and energy and interest to protect human rights everywhere all the time. Right? These researchers are scarce. And what that means is that even in the portfolio of things that we have interests to protect, we have to make choices about which are the areas where we're going to utilize those resources and where are we not. And this is our very uncomfortable conversation now because this is where we have to be making moral and ethical choices about who gets attention and who doesn't. When we believe, and the law tells us, and morally I think we know that's right, that everybody deserves help. Right? So we need a system for making this decision, and the systems in which we're doing it <clears throat> are not the systems that are lining up with effective policy. So triage is a metaphor, if you will, right? And I think we're used to thinking about triage as something that trained medical professionals do. But bear with me for a minute and see if I can convince you. I think it's not that different from a lot of what human rights promotion efforts look like, right? We're in crises. The demand for treatment far outstrips what we can actually do. And so we have to set priorities. That's what triage is, right? Human rights promoters are in the same position limited sets of resources. They have an array of policy tools, but they can't use them all to help everybody everywhere at all times. They have to set these priorities. So how do we do this? So I'm going to suggest a couple of different possible components to a system for triage. The first is that Unlike doctors in emergency rooms who have taken Hippocratic Oath and who you would hope do not bring in their personal biases into making decisions about who should first get medical treatment, and that's 
may or may not be the case in all cases. We have no choice in this conversation but to put national interest front and center. We will never, ever convince states to get involved in human rights actions uh, for themselves or for others when it is not in their interest to do so. And so that means we have no choice but to put state interests front and center. We have to be pragmatic about this. The second part of triage is that it would require building mechanisms that would allow us to look at what's effective. Instead of intervening in areas where there's the most public outcry or where we have some other national interest to do so, we must always have a national interest to do so, right? We are best off utilizing resources where we think they have the highest probability of actually having an impact. Because otherwise, we're utilizing resources, wasting those resources. We have not helped save uh, the human rights of anyone. And that is an absolute tragic shame, OK? So this process suggests that we need to think about the calculus on which we are making these decisions and have the effectiveness of policy be at the center of that calculus. And that, too, looks very, very different from the way foreign policy is run today. So I want to just conclude by saying that in the 20th century, in the last decade of this century, we know that human rights violations have cost the lives of hundreds of millions of people and have displaced and harmed hundreds of millions more in this process, right? So we are living in a world with a lot of violence and a lot of repression of basic human dignity. And this is a crisis. I see it that way, and I hope you do too. We have a lot of people who are attentive to this and who are thinking carefully about how can we reduce this crisis? How can we address this? And what I'm suggesting is that I think we need to talk about a change in strategy, promotion strategy, that we need to embrace a larger role for power, but also for partiality in the service of the law, not against the law. Because much of what actually motivates that behavior will come from state engagement. And that's an area where I think we have the possibility to actually do more. So the question is, how do we do this? Now, this is very uncomfortable because what I'm suggesting is a pretty sharp turn away from the global legal strategy that has been really at the center of our promotion efforts for the last 60 years. I fundamentally believe that the real tension here is not between law and power. Law is never devoid of power, uh, and I don't think it needs to be, nor it should be. But the tension is between this aspiration that we have to promote universal, indivisible concepts and the just, frank political reality that we can't. We have to be partial, and we have to create hierarchies, and that is very uncomfortable to do. Um, but the sooner we can sit down and talk about that in an open space and come up with strategies, I think uh, the better. So I'm going to leave my uh, remarks there. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I really look forward to your comments and thoughts and questions and our discussion.